Uh, we're very happy to have uh, Ignacio Cuesta from uh, Stanford University. Uh, he's going to talk about quality regulation and competition, evidence from pharmaceutical markets. So um, you know, it's very exciting to hear this uh, kind of work because uh, in some ways in India, we are going to be facing with, we are facing many issues in the healthcare sector where quality regulation is, uh, you know, is sort of, you know, uh, top of the policy agenda, but at the same time, we have a very active, uh, you know, we have very active competition in uh, all sorts of uh, uh, markets. So pharmaceutical markets, hospital markets, uh, you know, medical appliances markets, so on and so forth. So um, I'm looking forward to this talk. Uh, so we'll go for one hour and the talk is being recorded and we will then share it on YouTube as well. So, um, you know, the floor is all yours and, uh, you know, let's, Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Great. Um, well, thanks, Tarun. Thanks, uh, Anuj, uh, for um, for having me. It's um, it's actually a pleasure to be able to talk to you. And I, I think, as Tarun was saying, this is a topic that is quite is like particularly important for developing countries where we are like trying to get markets to work, but where issues of asymmetric information and inequality space often make it hard for it to happen. Um, so yeah, this is going to be joint work with Juan Pablo Atal from UPenn and also Martin Setre from the Norwegian School of Economics. Okay, so, and I mean, as we said before, please uh, interrupt in case you have any questions. Okay, so what's the high level motivation for the project? Um, so we wanted to think about asymmetric information about product quality, that is environments in which consumers have a hard time verifying whether a product is good or bad in terms of quality. Okay, if that is the case, and we can go back to the kind of like the accurate of uh, logic, uh, what happens is that demand for us to pay decreases, and that in turn affect uh, firm incentives to both in terms of pricing, but also in terms of the products that they put in the market, and then overall wealth. Okay, so that's the classic uh, accurate of result. Okay? And then one way in which um, uh, policymakers often deal with this uh, market failure is quality regulation. That is setting say a minimum quality standard right such that if you want to be in the market if you want to be a hospital in the market in terms of example right you have to satisfy at least at least the minimum quality right and the the, the, the way in which that you know, at least partially solves asymmetric information is by telling consumers on the other side you know we know you may not perfectly observe quality but like rest assured that is at least at this level right so you're essentially truncated the lower tail of the distribution of quality, okay? And this is very common in professional labor markets. There is licensing for lawyers, architects, teachers, and so forth. Also in childcare services, in educational systems with the, you know, using test scores and so forth, okay? Um, so yeah, very, very widespread. And then how can this affect, impact um, uh, markets? Well, there's going to be, you know, we identify and focus on three channels. The first one is, essentially the, the mechanical effect on market structure. You have a distribution of quality, you set up a minimum quality standard, and all the firms that are offering quality below the standard are not going to be able to certify their quality, so they leave the market, okay? That already has some competitive effect. Why? Well, because there's less asymmetric information, right? And so there's the less vertical differentiation and firms are going to compete more uh, intensively in terms of prices. That's one of the promises of quality uh, regulation, okay? And I, 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 and I, I'm happy to hear about um, the, the experience of uh, Tarun in, in, in hospitals, right? And then the, the, the other part of the trade-up, if you want, is that certification is often costly, right? And you know, when, when lawyers have to certify, they are asked to train for two years before getting a, a diploma, right? And when hospitals have to certify, they are asked to satisfy a bunch of things and to prepare a bunch of paperwork. And similarly, when drugs have to certify, which is going to be my setting, they have to pass a bunch of tests, which are costly, okay? So if this is costly, it's essentially as increasing the entry costs or the fixed costs of operating in the market, right? And that's going to, in the margin, induce some exit, right? So there's, a, there's going to be a trade-off between decreased vertical differentiation and increased um, fixed cost of being in the market by which you know, the, the overall effect 
of uh, quality regulation is going to be ambiguous. Maybe we're going to get higher prices, maybe we're going to get lower prices, and it's going to depend on the relative strength of these two effects, okay? So, um, and, you know, in this paper, we're going to try to make some progress in terms of understanding and measuring this trade. Our setting is going to be pharmaceutical markets, okay? So, and, and again, this is a, a kind of like a, a market that is particularly relevant um, for uh, developing countries, because in developed countries, we already have very good quality regulation in place. If you think of uh, the US and the European Union, they have had um, uh, very high standards, very high quality standards for a while now, so quality is not an issue. However, if you think of developing countries, which don't often have such standards in place, drug quality may actually be somewhat hard to verify by consumers. We are we're not experts, right? And we really rely on our doctors and our physicians for them to prescribe something to us, okay? And then if the doctor says, uh, take the branded or take the innovator, we're not going to feel often uh, comfortable uh, substitu substituting towards a cheaper and branded generic, right? So that, that's kind of the issue. However, the WHO, you know, 22 years ago now, already stated that it was important uh, that if we wanted for gen if we wanted generics to actually be able to penetrate markets and compete with innovator and brand drugs, we had to assure to consumers that those generics were of high quality. Okay, so so far developing countries have not really done so, but they're trying. Okay, and then one particular policy that they are trying to implement in many countries is called bioequivalence. Bioequivalence is a policy, or like a, a standard that essentially assures that two drugs, that a particular generic actually is equivalent to the innovator drug that is trying to copy. Not only from a safety point of view, but also from an efficacy point of view. That is, it, it's not like that it's not going to like kill you or harm you or intoxicate you. It's actually that it's going to work in the same way than the innovator. Okay, so it's a, it's a higher standard, okay? And this, as I said, it's already quite common in developed countries, but it's uh, it, it has only been developed, um, like implemented recently in other places. And India and China are two examples that have uh, started to roll this out. My understanding is that nowadays India has almost a full rollout of bioequivalence. It's also true that many countries in Latin America have been implementing this policy, including Colombia, Mexico, uh, Brazil, and also Chile, which is going to be my setting. Okay. So what we do in, the, in this paper is essentially to proceed in three steps. First, we start by exploiting variation from a policy reform that implemented or introduced quality regulation, in particular, this bioequivalence standard in uh, 2011, and then in a staggered fashion in different molecules, markets, uh, throughout the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical market between 2011 and 2017. Okay, we're going to leverage that variation in a different diff design. So, like no model yet, just trying to describe what happened in terms of market outcomes to look at its impacts, right? And we're going to find that the number of drugs in the market fell by 25 percent. So that's a large impact, and then also that prices increased by 13 percent. Okay, and and all those effects are concentrated in um, small markets, okay? So if you were to stop there, one story would be something like, you know, you do quality regulation, and all that that, that that does is to increase fixed costs, so firms end up exiting, right? And the fixed cost part really comes from this heterogeneity by which most of the effects are in small markets where fixed costs are more relevant, right? However, that, that's, you know, we argue and we find actually an incorrect reading of the results. Because it may well be that yes, there is some exit, but part of that exit could be from low quality drugs. And also it could be that the guys that are staying, sure, they're charging higher prices, but they, they're charging higher prices because now consumers know that those guys are high quality, okay? So essentially this is like, this is actually what would happen in an acre uh, environment where the good cars are now able to sell, right? So that's going to be our reading. But to establish that, we're going to develop and then estimate a model of entry, certification, and demand. Okay? And in the model, we're going to allow for heterogeneous quality, asymmetric information, and also for consumer misperceptions, okay? which are kind of like three demand frictions that we, 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 we care about in the context of this project. Okay? 
And we're going to show using the estimates that exit is actually largely due to low drop quality at baseline. Okay. So it's not, it's not about the certification cost. Sure, the certification cost reinforce that but it's mostly due to, to, to low drop quality. Okay, so it's, the regulation is actually able to chop the, the lower tail of the distribution of quality. Okay, I'm going to tell you how we get to that uh, conclusion. Okay, and then, uh, which we think is like the more um, fun part, if you want, of the paper, we use the estimated model to um, estimate some, some counterfactual policies. Okay, so to study some counterfactual policies. For example, we start by saying what would have happened if the certification costs were lower, and that actually is good. That's also, you know, if you're if you're designing a quality regulation, you don't want to make it too heavy-handed on 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 the firms that you're trying to certify, because if you make it too costly, they're going to decide to exit the market, right? So not surprising, but we, we put numbers there. Then we also think of information policies that could reduce aversion towards generics, right? So. And we, sh we, we show that they actually interact in interesting ways with the with actual quality regulation. Okay. And then uh, finally, we compare regulation to disclosure. So regulation is going to be, you know, if you are below the standard, you have to leave. Disclosure is going to be instead, you know, if you're below the standard, you can, you can still be in the market, but we're going to tell people that you're uh, of low quality. So we're going to have consumers make uh, informed uh, choices. Uh, turn. So, you know, my question is that to what extent is quality determined by like individual consumers? I mean, I'd be very surprised if, you know, me, I have to determine the quality of a drug, uh, even though I'm not a physician or I'm not a hospital, it would be the case that, for example, for drugs that are administered in a hospital-based setting, the, you know, consumer in this case is a, a hospital. And so in that sense, you know, they have enough expertise to determine uh, drug quality, or you know, why would we even for drugs that are not administered in a hospital-based setting, uh, non-prescription -prescri drugs? I mean, there's typically like a quality regulator who has to decide quality for you know everyone, and they don't. So in that sense, they don't have to. You know, we don't have to no, sorry, that's a job, a job over to individuals. Yeah, that's a good question. So, in most, so uh, I mean. Um, as I was saying in the previous slide, in many developing countries, the, the, the standard that's in place is the standard that is called of safety, okay? So safety is something like, we're going to assure that this drug doesn't uh, intoxicate people and so forth. So it's like a pretty low standard, right? So now you do that and there's going to be a bunch of drugs in the market. There's going to be the innovator, there's going to be branded generics and unbranded generics, right? The question is whether we, and, and by we, I say like consumers, as you say, but also maybe physicians and maybe also the uh, person in charge of sourcing the hospital, uh, trust the generics that pass that standard the same way that we trust, say, the innovator from some international lab, right? And then argue, you, you could argue that, yes, I mean, the, do the doctor is an expert or the hospital manager is an expert, but then still they could have some mistrust, right? So that's one that's one uh, that's one uh, that's one example. Now, outside the hospital setting, when you give consumers some choice and they can go to the pharmacy and decide whether with a prescription they want or not to substitute a branded generic for a generic for a number of the generic or so, you know the, the the asymmetry, if you want, is even stronger. So I agree with you that the, there's going to be less asymmetric information for the physician or for the hospital manager. But I would argue that that asymmetric information is not going to be zero. There's still going to be some of it, even for experts in this context where there's a lot of uh, there's a where there's a lot of dispersion in actual quality. So, so I just want to make one announcement. So you know our attendees. So there are panelists and attendees. So uh, the way for attendees to ask questions is just to uh, you know show their hand, uh, which is raise hand and uh, then someone will click the allow to talk button which will unmute you and then you can ask questions. So feel free to ask questions uh, by just raising your hand. Yeah, please. Okay, so that's that's the... Um, yeah, so that, that's the, you know, the structure of the, of the paper. I'm going to try to go through this, through the three parts during the talk. 
In terms of contribution to the literature, we see the paper as contributing to two distinct literatures. The first one is like on quality regulation. There's some um, very nice, uh, simple and rich theory from the mostly from the 80s on the topic. Uh, we our model is going to build on that, and then there's been empirical applications on many many markets, including childcare, occupational licensing, and e-commerce. Less so in pharma. So, and most of it has been descriptive or reduced form, whereas we're going to try to let like, go build an empirical model and try to say something about welfare effects. Okay, and then we also speak a bit to the literature that study that studies pharmaceutical markets in particular. There's the work on regulation, work on generic entry, work on generic aversion. I feel like we have a bit to say about each of those uh, of, uh, of those topics, and we are going to kind of explain how quality regulation interacts with uh, both um, entry and aversion in particular. Okay. Okay. So let me tell you a bit about the setting. As I told you, we're, we were going to be looking at, at Chile, which is um, it's now a middle-income country, but it's like just like a recent middle-income country. So I feel like there's a, a lot, a lot to be learned from it uh, for for developing countries too. Um, this is going to be a setting where, we, and you know, when I present this paper to kind of like a U.S. audience or, or so, they are somewhat surprised by some of these facts. But then you present it to a more like developing country uh, audience, and they are not surprised because this is how things work in many places, right? So for one, drugs matter a lot for households in terms of spending. Um, a lot, so a large share of the out of out of pocket health spending comes actually from their spending in drugs. Okay. Then there's also limited prescription drug uh, coverage in the retail market, so the insurance for drugs is is very weak in these settings. There's also less regulation. Like you go to Europe and prices are very regulated. You go to the developing world and there's less price regulation. So you can get these wild uh, price differences uh, between uh, branded and unbranded drugs. And then finally, there's no advertising. Okay. There's, there's some advertising through physicians, but there's no direct to consumer advertising. Okay. So that, that's the environment. And there's going to be three segments in the market. And this is actually, so I, I have a couple of students that are working on Indian uh, pharma. So I, I became a bit familiar with the setting. And my understanding is that you also have these uh, three segments. So the first one is going to be um, innovator drugs. So these are the guys that, you know, 20 years ago created a molecule, right? Pfizer and so forth. So this molecule is atorvastatin and Pfizer back then called this, this uh, product Lipitor, okay? So it's going to be the, kind of the leader patent drug in the market that now is off patent. Okay, so the, and then there's going to be two types of generics. First, there's going to be branded generics, which are, are going to be drugs that are produced by some manufacturer, which is a generic manufacturer, but it's going to market uh, the product with a fantasy name and may engage in some advertising through physicians. Okay. And then thirdly, there's going to be unbranded generics, which are the ones who sell by the molecule name. So there's no fantasy name here. There's just this uh, molecule name, atrovastatin. okay? So branded generics are trying to sort of like become distinguishable by having these fantasy names, and you're going to be consuming, in this case, in this case say, Lipotin, whereas these guys are just being you know, put together in a, in, a, in a bag with all the atrovastatins and branded generics. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about these three segments throughout the talk. Okay, and interestingly, there's like vast price differences. So here I, I, I have in the x-axis something like 30 or 35 um, uh, molecules, and in the y-axis I'm going to have relative price premiums. So that's going to be essentially in blue the average price of the innovator within a, uh, within a molecule, okay, over the average price of the unbranded generic within the same molecule. And then the same thing in gray for branded generics relative to unbranded generics, okay? You know, the, the striking part of this plot is that if you look at this blue dashed line, the, num the, the average premium that innovators charge relative to unbranded generics is 10. So that is like 10 times the price within the same molecule. And then the average premium that branded generics charge relative to uh, unbranded generics is around six. Okay, so huge price differences within the same molecule. And interestingly, branded and unbranded generics are actually um, uh, both generics, right? So, 
it's uh, surprising. Okay, so huge price differences. However, that's not reflected in market shares. If you look at the branded generic market share, that's as high as 50%, okay? Whereas for unbranded generics, the market share is only 30. Okay, so you can charge six times more and still get more market share. Okay, so there's clearly something going on on the demand side there, okay? And then uh, if you compare this to say some advanced economies, in the US, the unbranded generic market share is around 90%, okay? So certainly there's a, this demand friction seem to be slowing down the penetration of unbranded generics in this setting, okay? And I, I think that, you know, that again, that's an explanation that applies to many other settings, not only to um, the one we study, okay? So how was quality relation in this setting around, around the reform? Well, before the reform, the only standard was safety. So that's, you know, you have to um, essentially, you know, show some production standards, like the facilities are clean. There's no, uh, nothing going into the pills that shouldn't be going and so forth. Okay. And in that context, the sanitary authority said, look, we're going to do a quality relation reform. We want to do two things. The first one is to ensure quality standards. We, know, we don't want low quality drugs in the market. And the second is going to be to increase competition by reducing perceived quality differences, right? So we wanna make sure that consumers know that the drugs that remain in the market after these are going to be of high quality, okay? So in terms of implementation, as I said before, this was implemented in a staggered fashion across molecules between 2011 and 2017, which was useful because it, I mean, for us as researchers, because it provides us with variation that we can use in a different diff setting. A different uh, strategy, okay. And then the other part that's important to know is that this was not free to certify, right? So firms that were in the market before or that wanted to enter the market had to get this um, certification from private laboratories that could do the testing, and that would cost somewhere between twenty and twenty and, and two hundred, between fifty and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per drug. Okay, so that may sound small, but actually the average revenue, uh, the average annual revenue of a drug in this setting is within that range. Okay, so in some markets, that's going to be uh, certainly not, not a trivial uh, amount. Okay, and then together with these certification requirements, the authority wanted to inform consumers about its results, right? So they impose the drugs that passed the requirement and were to continue marketing the drug would have to go with this label, okay? And then, you know, back in the time, if you had gone to a pharmacy, there would be kind of like educational banners everywhere saying, look, if you see this yellow and red label, that means that the drug is actually equivalent to the innovator trying to teach consumers uh, that they, you know, the, how to interpret those uh, quality signals, okay? Good. So in terms of data, we're going to combine two data sources. The first one is going to be a national drug registry, um, which essentially is like the, a collection of drug licensing and renewal dates from the sanitary authority, okay? If for each country, for each drug, we can actually see uh, the country of manufacture, Okay, so where it's coming from, and then finally also the date of bioequivalent certification. And then we're going to match that to data from IQVIA, which uh, some of you may know. So IQVIA is a, a multinational firm that collects uh, retail prices and sales for drugs in many, many countries. Okay, so in, the, in, in, in our case, we have data for monthly sales and prices at the national level for each drug in 2010 to 2017 for the whole retail market, okay? Okay, so let me show you first what we find from the descriptive analysis. Okay, so first I wanna show you um, essentially that we have a first stage, okay? So here I'm, I'm going to show you a bunch of a few plots that are, are going to have time in the in the x-axis and then some outcome in the y-axis. And in particular in this one, I'm showing you the number of certifications in the market 
around the announcement of the policy. Okay, and you can see that there's like nothing going on essentially before the policy change, but that after the policy change, there's a sharp increase in the number of certifications. Okay, it's slow at the beginning, right? And that's because it took time for firms to actually go out and get the, the, the certifications, but then it speeds up. And then, you know, like by say like two, three, four years after the reform, there was a bunch of certification, okay? And that's true for both branded generics in green and unbranded generics in uh, gray, okay? So, you know, something happened as a result of this, uh, of this policy change. Then, was there a change in market structure? That's the second question that we ask. And well, here I'm, I'm doing the same thing. So time around the announcement of the policy. And then in the y-axis, I'm going to have the change in the number of drugs. And in particular, in gray, I'm plotting entry, which is fairly flat throughout the period of study. And then in blue, I'm going to have exit, okay? And you can see that there was a some exit before the policy change, that right after the policy change, there's not a lot of changes in the pattern of exit, but then there is a large and, and, and stark in, uh, increase in the amount of exit, okay? And you may be wondering, like, why does it take so long to start falling? And the reason for that is that in terms of compliance, the way this worked is that the sanitary authority told firms, look, you have a deadline, you need to comply with that. If a firm couldn't comply with the deadline, what would happen is that the sanitary authority would not renew the next marketing license. And that could take a few years to, to come. Right, so there's like some fuzziness in the in the exit pattern in the exit pattern, but it, you know we consider that the food the overall pattern is actually quite strong. Right, there's clearly something uh, big happening in the second, you know, like after after a couple of years of the of the announcement. Yeah. Okay, so you know we put some more structure here. In particular, we as I said before, we ex we exploit the staggered bioequivalence requirements. In a diff and diff design. Ah, um, yeah, please turn. So my question is that you know what you showed the descriptive evidence was the demand for certification quality quality certification. Is there also some you know understanding of the supply? So you know in, at zero, imagine that there's not enough like labs or expertise yes. around. Uh, but even that expertise takes time, and you know, infrastructure to do the quality certification also takes time to develop. Yeah, that's a good question, actually. And um, so um, we don't have data on that, but we have anecdotes. So I'm, I'm talking, we talked a lot while, while working on this project with the sanitary authority. And one thing that they brought up repeatedly was that indeed at the beginning, uh, there was a, a bottleneck in terms of the of this um, capacity to certify because there were only a few uh, private labs that were essentially certified to certify. Right, and so firms had a hard time getting their certifications on time. And in practice, that implied that these deadlines were moved a few times. So there's like some, you know, at some point, firms would say, "Look, we have tried to certify, but we haven't been able. So please give us a bit more time." And then, as time passed, everyone was able was able to certify. But yes, I mean that's, and I imagine like I mean, again, like connecting to what we were talking about before about hospital certification. I've talked. To other people that works on, on on college, like university certification, and they also fell into the same bottlenecks. Like you know, finding capacity to evaluate and certify the quality of these big institutions is hard. And I can imagine that for hospitals is of course uh, similar. It's like you know, it's like really hard to generate that capacity. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, I guess universities could be a good a good uh, kind of like certificator of hospitals, but that's, a, I guess, a longer discussion. Yeah, good uh, good questions, thank you. Okay, so uh, so now I'm going to show you these uh, different, different results, okay? And in particular, I'm going to, instead of doing regression, like of showing you a, re a regression table, I'm going to show you these event study graphs. So this is essentially, you know, telling us something about the preprint leading to the, um, uh, to the policy and then about the impact of the policy after the um, after its announcement, okay? And essentially what we see from here is that, remember here we're comparing essentially treated versus untreated molecules. You can see that before the policy change, there was like no uh, differential treated, 
tri uh, differential trend between the treatment and control groups, but that after the policy change, there's a large increase in the number of uh, certified drugs for the treated group. Okay, so this is not surprising. We already saw it in the previous graph. But then we can start looking at the other outcomes, which are more interesting. So here I'm showing you again, the diff and version of what I showed you before for the number of drugs. So this is essentially combining the entry and exit of drugs and putting the number of drugs in the market on the left on the left hand side of the regression. Again, you can see that there's no pretrend leading to the event, but that after the event, there's a, a negative impact of the policy on the overall number of drugs, okay? In the paper, we can like do a calculation to put numbers to this. Um, and and what, what we find is that 25% of, so the number of drugs in the market decreased by 25% by the time the policy was fully in place, which is a large effect. And again, this is largely driven by exit in small markets. And then we look at prices. So here we, we have an index of average paid prices. Okay? And we again find that, uh, evidence for no differential preference leading to the event but we find a positive uh, effect, right? So average paid prices actually increased by around 13% when the policy was fully in place. And then we do some heterogeneity analysis and find that this is led by unbranded generics, okay? So, uh, you know, maybe the expectation of the policymaker was that unbranded generics would come into the market and got, that would reduce the prices of the innovator drug and the branded generics. That's not what we find. We actually find the opposite, okay? And then we look a bit at what drives this, and it is mostly price changes. It is not that, say, low-quality drugs are leaving the market, hence the compositional effect. Rather, it's actually price changes, okay? So this, uh, at the beginning, for us, was a bit surprising, but then with the model, we were able to, like, really uh, rationalize it and understand what, what was going on, okay? So taking stock a bit of what we find, what we have so far, is, um, you know, we could explain these patterns in two ways. On the one hand, we could say, no, there were compliance costs imposed by quality regulation, which um, led to led some firms to exit the market, and then prices increased mostly due to lower competition, okay? The alternative reading is that there were indeed some low quality drugs in the market at baseline, and so prices increased due to a higher willingness to pay, which is associated with reducing asymmetric information, and also, yes, to lower competition, but the asymmetric information part is key to this second explanation, okay? So to disentangle these two potential explanations, we're going to use a model, and the model is going to allow us to do three things. The first one is to uh, say something about mechanisms, try to say how much of this is coming from asymmetric information, generic aversion, and certification costs, Second, to say something about welfare. And thirdly, to say something about counterfactuals, okay? So in the second half of the talk, I'm going to try to um, show you a bit of the model. I think, you know, I may rush through a, a couple of the slides, but I'll try to, I'll try to give you all the relevant uh, details, okay? It, but I mean, I, I'd rather discuss than rush on my own. So please stop me if, in case that anything is unclear. Okay, so what's the kind of like the high level model structure? So this is going to be a model in which there's going to be some potential entrants, which are the laboratories, the manufacturers that are considering to enter the market. These laboratories are going to be of heterogeneous quality, okay? So they're going to be of either a high quality or a low quality, okay? And we're going to make it binary. So you are either high or low. And we're going to say that high quality means to actually be bioequivalent. So that is equivalent to the innovator, okay? So quality is going to be um, um, captured by this uh, variable psi, which is going to be zero one, okay? And the distribution of quality for this potential entrance is going to be as follows. If you are an innovator, so that is if your segment K is I, which is for the innovator, then the likelihood that you're of high quality is one. That is by assumption, right? And that's a normalization. We're normalizing high quality to being the innovator, essentially. Then if you are a branded or, or an unbranded generics, which are this B and this U, then the likelihood that you're of high quality is going to be pi, okay? Pi H, we call it. That's the, uh, so essentially, if you look at a, a, a set of potential entrants, of unbranded generic potential entrants, and you tell me that the 
uh, that pi is say 0.6, then that implies that there's six uh, high quality drugs in that bunch and four high quality drugs in that bunch. Sorry, I said, I, I said it wrong. It's six high quality, four low quality, okay? So, and if you think of consumers, well, in absence of quality regulation, they're going to see those 10. They don't know which, which one is the higher, the low quality, but they know that, you know, 60% of them are high quality and then 40% are low quality, okay? So the timing of the model is going to be as follows. In some initial period, and firms are going to draw their quality from this uh, distribution. They're going to draw an entry cost, a marginal cost, certification cost, and attributes, okay? And then firms are going to, miss, to make costly entry choices. In absence of quality relation, they're going to pay some entry cost F, okay? So that's going to be the fixed cost of entry. But then if there is quality relation, they're going to have to sink that entry cost F, but also a certification cost kappa, okay? So that's a, that's the sense in which certification may increase the costs of being in the market, okay? <clears throat> then firms enter, there is a, there's a market structure that is established, then they're going to compete in prices. So there's going to be a national trend kind of game, game that they're going to play. They're going to compete in prices given demand. And then in a third stage, consumers are going to demand drugs. So they know what drugs there are available. They know what prices they charge. And there's going to be some asymmetric information, which is going to depend on the policy environment and also some generic aversion. So they're going to, for some reason, which we actually don't microfound, dislike generics a bit, okay? So let me give you a bit of the of the demand. And this is actually quite important. No, not this one, but the next uh, the next slide. So demand is going to be essentially fix a molecule. Right? Think of atrophostatin. We're going to, within the molecule, tell consumers to choose either the outside option, which is get nothing, or one of the drugs that are offered in the market. Okay? The utility of a given drug, uh, J, in market M, which is going to be atrophostatin, is going to be some valuation V, net of uh, prices, and then there's going to be some uh, attributes, some time effects to account for, for, for the fact that the outset option could be changing over time. And then there's going to be this nested logit um, error term, which is essentially going to be a capturing differential substitution within segment and across uh, segments, okay? Okay, so this is very important to think about the economics of the problem. We're going to double click essentially on this uh, B part, which is the intercept of the demand curve, okay? And we're going to specify it as follows. We're going to say this is going to depend on three terms. The first one is going to be mu, okay? So mu is going to be the utility that you get if you get the high quality drug, okay? And then we're going to multiply that by two terms. The first one is going to be the expected quality, okay? So essentially, if this, if, if you are taking the innovator, you know that the innovator is of high quality, actually always, right? So this is essentially one, and you get the full utility mu m, okay? But then we're going to actually um, allow for a shift in expected quality, which, which we're going to call aversion against generics, and that's going to be tau. Okay, so let me give you a couple of examples of how this uh, structure works. Again, if you are the innovator, you know that this component, expected quality is one, and we're going to normalize that there is no aversion. It's not a generic, so you can be uh, you can you can have that aversion, and so the value of getting the in, the um, the innovator is going to be mu m. Okay, now the interesting part comes when we think about generics. So let's consider, for example, a branded generic, right? before the policy change, okay? So with V, which is bioequivalence, equal to zero. Then the intercept of demand in that point, the expected, this like perceived quality is going to be mu M, but then we're going to multiply that by pi H first. That is, we're going to say, look, we know that AMRA and generics are only high quality pi uh, percent of the time, right? And then we're going to adjust that with whatever uh, aversion we had against that segment, which is going to be tau. And we're actually going to allow for tau to be a function of bioequivalence as well, okay? So we're going to allow for bioequivalence perhaps to increase or decrease aversion. We're going to estimate that, okay? Now, if we do the same exercise, but uh, with, um, you know, after the policy change is in place, so with bioequivalence, okay? What's going to be the perceived quality? Well, you still get mu, 
now instead of multiplying it by pi, you know that drugs that survive the policy are of high quality. So this is going to be one. You know that every drug in the market is actually equivalent to the innovator. But for some reason, some of the generic aversion may persist, right? So we're going to have this um, wedge tau, which is going to be perhaps different than what it was before the policy. And that is captured by the fact that there's like a zero here. So before the policy and a one here, so after the policy, okay? So that, that's, a, that's a structure of demand. And you can see how the different channels are going to operate. Okay. <clears throat> so in terms of, I mean, jumping a bit to empirics right away, I think it's you know easy to note why it's going to be hard to identify this structure. Essentially, from, from a loaded model, you can get the intercept easily. So you can get these Vs, but you can't really tell what drives that V. Is it mu? Is it pi? Is it tau, right? It's hard to tell, right? So what we're going to do is to actually get only the Vs from the demand side. And then from the supply side, we're going to get this blue component, the expected quality. I'm going to tell you how. And then we're going to essentially recover the a version component as a residual, right? So we're going to have the V, we're going to have the, the quality component, we take it to the left-hand side, and then we, we recover a tau, okay? Good. So let me skip that. Okay, let's go for a second to the supply side. In the supply side, we're going to have um, the second stage in which firms compete in prices given market structure, that's standard. In the first stage, we're going to have an entry game. Okay, so in the entry game, all firms are going to be thinking, um, are going to be making static entry and certification choices. They're going to know who the potential entrants are, but they're not going to know who is going to enter or not, right? So they're going to be simultaneously choosing whether or not to enter, okay? What are the profits? Well, there's going to be first variable profits that is conditional on entry, what you're going to get if you set prices optimally. You need to sync this entry cost if you are a new entrant. And then if there is regulation, you need to sync this uh, certification cost if you are a generic, okay? And then there's going to be this profit, this, uh, profit shop, okay? So this is it. like in the kind of like in the taxonomy of entry games, there's going to be an entry game with private information where both your quality and your profit shock are private information and all the rest is going to be common knowledge, okay? And so there's going to be an equilibrium that is um, essentially a fixed point in entry probabilities, okay? so the this is like, you know, there's like a bunch of papers uh, after this paper that I cite here by Katya Syme that have this, uh, this same uh, uh, structure and we build on those uh, on those papers. Um, yeah, please. Ignacio, uh, you know, just for the sake of the audience, can you explain perhaps why, um, say, a dynamic model would be very difficult to estimate in here? So, for example, I'm thinking that uh, we learned something about firm type over time. Yes. Right? Uh, that you are a firm that tends to produce poor quality pharmaceuticals versus high quality pharmaceuticals, and uh, customers are learning that. Now, I know you're not doing that, right? And yeah. my guess is that the quick answer is because it's very difficult, but at least for the sake of uh, the attendees, can you please help us understand what are the difficulties in understanding some of those things which might otherwise be relevant in a market? Yeah, no, totally, totally. So, I mean, in um... Okay, so okay, let, 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 it's a good question. Let me try to uh, organize my thoughts here. So clearly we're making very strong choices in terms of the timing, right? So we're essentially organizing things uh, in two cross sections. We're going to have one cross section that is before regulation. And we're going to say, look, firms are choosing whether or not to enter in sort of a myopic way. So they are not thinking about uh, future profits. They are not thinking about the fact that the policy is coming down the road and so forth. And then we're going to have a second cross-section that is after the policy change. For that one, we are going to take into account the baseline market structure because we're going to say, for example, entry costs are not going to have to be paid again for firms that were already in the market, but we're again, not going to think about any dynamics after that. So that's essentially the end of the road. Okay, so that, that's how we think about it. On the demand side, so I'm going to get to your point. Uh, I'm trying to organize. Uh, so on the demand side, we essentially, again, have a very static uh, um, demand side in which we think of demand before the policy change, right? And then we allow the policy change to change demand, but in one shot. 
Okay, so other work, and in particular here, there's a very nice paper by Crawford and Shum in uh, Econometrica in 2006 that thinks about learning, right? So drugs, and in particular, if you have a chronic disease, are a space where, where there's a lot of learning because you're trying to find kind of the right match for you. So say you have some chronic disease, you're going to try drugs until you find one that makes your disease work very well, right? And they study that problem. If you do that from a pure demand side perspective, so you're trying to essentially understand consumer learning, that's hard, but not super hard, right? Uh, you can you need to estimate a dynamic demand model essentially. But then if you wanna think about the supply side reactions to that, you know, how firms take that into account, that's quite tricky, right? So if there is a perfect competition, it's not too hard because there's no strategic component and with uh, some kind of like marginal cost pricing condition, you can deal with that, that's fine. If there is a monopoly, it's also not too hard because the, you know, the, price, the pricing equation will be simple, will be kind of like different, but you're still, there's still no strategic component. So when the difficulties arise is when there are um, strategic components. So the, the really difficult uh, thing to do is to take dynamic oligopoly models to the data. And the reason by which that's like really hard is that, you know, so say that you're, you're thinking about this like demand with learning and then firms being dynamic and thinking about the future. Firms would have to be super sophisticated in terms of kind of like taking expectations and calculating the value of a consumer because they, 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 they would have to be thinking about what the consumer learning path would be over time. And, and you know, computationally, that's very hard to do. Also in terms of, thinking about say um, uh, uniqueness versus multiplicity of equilibria is very hard to do. And I think even theoretically, it's, it's unclear whether all of that can be, can be done. Yeah, I, my guess is the learning path for the consumers, but also the, uh, the path for themselves as well as their competitors. So you have to make, you have exactly. to add yes. all three, all three. Oh yeah, 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 sorry. I, I was imprecise yeah. on that, but that's totally right. Yeah, you need to think of what your competitor will do if their consumers learn, how that will affect the competitors' prices and so forth, and then um, you know the set of things that you have to keep track of the the state space mm -hmm. uh, becomes huge very fast. Yeah, that's a uh, no, no, yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean we we got some. Uh, we, I mean we throughout the project we, we we got some push in that direction, but we never found uh, kind of like a doable way to go the, in that direction. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, I'm going to like, you know, really like surf here uh, over the estimation. Getting the marginal cost is not hard. We can get it through a standard marginal cost inversion. So we write down the Nashberg Trend pricing conditions and we recover prices from that using the uh, demand estimates. Entry cost and certification costs are going to come from the, from the entry model. Okay, so that's the, the standard, yeah, kind of like the standard output of an entry model. And then what we find a bit more interesting is how we recover the share of high quality drugs. And the argument, which is an identification argument, is as follows. Imagine like, so think, think of the distribution of predicted profits by the model. So say you have the profit function and you have a distribution of predicted profits, right? You're going to have some drugs that are going to have very high uh, pred predicted profits, right? So if the certification cost is fixed, right, and you 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 know it, right? For a given uh, certification cost, these high profitability drugs could never exit, right? Because they, they, you know they have enough profit that they can pay the, the 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 certification cost. Okay. So if in the data you see that some of those firms are exiting, we looking at the model have to have to like uh, conclude, right? or read that they're exiting because of low quality. Okay, so the argument is essentially an identification and infinity argument where we say, look, the share of high quality, uh, sorry, the share of drugs that exit when they're very profitable is going to be informative about the share of high quality drugs among potential entrants, okay? And that's how we recover the, uh, essentially the distribution of uh, quality, which are these pies that I showed you before, okay? And then once we have that, we can recover a generic aversion, as I told you. Okay. 
Good. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm, we estimate demand using uh, standard methods. We find elasticities that are within the range of the literature. As expected, consumers of innovator drugs have a lower price elasticity. Okay. And then, um, and then on the on the supply side, I would say the more interesting part is uh, again the share of high quality generics, which is which is actually quite different for branded and unbranded generics. So for branded generics, the number is going to be ninety percent. So nine of every so one of every ten branded generics is of low quality. That is is not by equivalent in our setting before the policy change. Whereas 35% of unbranded generics are of low quality. Okay, so very different uh, for both uh, segments. Okay, and certainly not one, right? So certainly not. Uh, so there, there were like some. So this is already telling us that some of the exit that we saw in the descriptive evidence is actually related to quality, not only to the compliance costs. Okay. Good. So I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, and I'm going to jump to the welfare and counterfactual analysis. Okay, so how do we do welfare in an environment like this? I, I gave you a demand structure that was like fairly rich, right? And in particular, I told you that there were two, friction, two frictions on the demand side that we care about. The first one was asymmetric information. So when there is asymmetric information, you choose based on some expected quality, but then what you get in the end is the actual quality, right? So you choose looking at this, but you get in terms of utility this, right? The actual, the actual quality side. Then in terms of generic aversion, choice is based on whatever aversion you have, but then you know you need to take a stance on what the true generic aversion should be, right? Or the welfare relevant component of generic aversion is, okay? So in the paper, we show results for two assumptions. First, um, one in which we say, look, we're going to use like actual quality as welfare relevant, and then uh, we're going to impose that whatever generic aversion we estimate after the policy is well for relevant. Okay, so that is we're going to give the benefit of the doubt to physicians that keep prescribing, um, say, brand generics or innovators. Okay, uh, because, because we're not physicians and we want we don't we don't want to kind of like overrule them. Okay, an alternative and more aggressive welfare assumption would be to say that actually none of the generic aversion is both relevant. And some people think that way. They say, no, we should give unbranded generics to everyone. They're all the same thing. We don't really take a stance there and we offer results for both uh, assumptions, okay? So this distinction is essentially a distinction between choice utility and experience utility, which is um, is becoming quite important in kind of like in public economics. And we think it's particularly important in this uh, in this setting. So in terms of welfare, there's going to be four forces here. The first one is welfare of consumers. So the compensating variation from a policy. The second one is going to be the change in variable profits. The third one is going to be savings on fixed costs, right? So a, a, a nice thing about kicking some firms out in equilibrium is that we're going to save as a society in fixed costs. And the, the, the fourth one is going to be also savings in terms of certification costs, okay? Okay, and now what I really wanna show you is um, before jumping into the policy stuff in the last five minutes, is going to be this decomposition, okay? Because this is, I feel like, you know, where the, the model really shows why it's useful in terms of understanding the mechanisms. So I, again, I told you about three mechanisms. The first one is that the minimum quality standard, which we call psi underbar, okay? So that is the, the, the minimum quality standard. In this is this mechanical exit and results asymmetric information. Okay. The second component is going to be, well, tau, which is generic aversion, and the third one is going to be kappa. Okay. So the way in which we decompose outcomes is as follows: outcomes in the model depend on these three um, uh, forces. So to get at the effect of the minimum quality standard only, we're going to fix aversion at its baseline level. We're going to fix certification costs at zero. And we're going to move from a world in which the quality standard is low, that is, we, are, we have no uh, bioequivalence in place, to a world in which the quality standard is high. Okay, so that is a world in which we're imposing that everyone has to be equivalent to the innovator. Okay, so that's the first component of the decomposition. The second one over here is going to be okay, now we have the high quality standard. What happens if we go from the baseline generic aversion? to the generic aversion as estimated after the policy change. That's going to be the component of the change in outcomes that comes from generic aversion. 
And then the third one is going to be fixing those two, adding the effect of the uh, certification process, okay? So in the end, we're comparing this quantity, right? Which is with all the three changes to this quantity, which is none of the three changes, but we're doing it step by step, okay? So let me show you some graphs. So first, I'm going to have three panels, number of firms on the left, average price in the middle, and then welfare on the right. And then I'm going to have segments essentially. Okay, so first I'm showing you effects of the minimum quality standard alone, okay? And then what that does is to remove some brand generics from the market, something like 6% of, of them, and then also remove some unbranded generics from the market, something like 22%, okay? But notice that these numbers are lower than what I told you uh, was the share of low quality drugs. And the reason for that is that when you take the low quality products away from the market, some high quality products that were outside of the market, so they were like potential entrants, but were not in the market because in equilibrium, there was like no room for them, decide to enter, okay? So uh, this is similar to, you know, in the context of hospitals, again, if we remove some of the low quality hospitals and we are left with less hospitals, we may expect that in equilibrium, some firms who are not in the market yet decide to enter and, and take essentially the place that the, those firms, um, the, the exiting firms left open in the market, okay? So they, they were like profitable opportunities for entry after the exit of the low quality hospitals, okay? In terms of prices though, there is an increase of these two segments. This is going to come from two forces, one, less competition, the second one, the fact that there is more willingness to pay for these firms because asymmetric information is lower. And then there's going to be an increase in welfare of consumers and firms, okay? So both. Now we have the second um, I just There's a question. Uh, so Padmavati, uh, so Mayama, can you unmute Padmavati, please? So she'd like to ask a question. Maybe he can, she can put it in the yeah so, right. I mean, uh, is it possible to unmute her? It seems as if she's muted. Huh. Yes. Hello. I think she dropped. It's just dropped out. Sorry. That's fine. Anyway, I'm, I'm happy to stay a bit after in case there are more questions. Sure. Or, or like if you prefer just uh, to put them in the no, chat. We can, we can ask uh, questions either way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then I was saying there's this second component that comes from reducing generic aversion. Um, and essentially what the policy did was to reduce uh, the... Um, okay. Okay. I, I, okay, I thought someone had a question. Um, so what the policy did was to reduce the gap in perceived quality between in branded and unbranded generics. So it got unbranded generics closer to branded generics, okay? And that, what it does in equilibrium is to induce some additional um, unbranded generics to enter the market and some additional brand generics to exit the market, okay? Which is what we see here. And also some unbranded generics to in the margin increase prices a bit, okay? So overall that, you know, reduces consumer welfare by a bit, not, not by a lot, right? But still the overall impact of the, of the policy is positive, okay? And then finally, we have the third force, which are the certification costs. And what we see is that indeed, that increases exit by quite a bit, right? So it doubles the exit of uh, brand generics, and then it increases the exit of unbranded generics by something like maybe like a third, right? So it's a, it has a strong impact. And overall exit is higher because of that, right? Of course, now that you know, we, we already saw the asymmetric information, we affected the version. If we take some products away from the market, you're going to get higher prices. That is what you get. So prices increase in the three segments of the market. And you know, having less variety and higher prices is not good for consumers. So they end up with a lower um, welfare. Okay. Regard, like, sure, I mean, certification costs harm welfare, but still the overall impact of the policy ends up being positive, okay? So adding up, it seems like, you know, the increase in quality from, from uh, in quality and perceived quality 
of generics dominate uh, the decrease in competition we find and welfare increases by something like 3.6 percent in the market okay? so it's a it's a sizable increase okay in terms of counterfactuals I'm going to give you only the summary because I know we're out of time it's this one we essentially compare the baseline quality standard which is in this upper corner of the plot with the different other policies such as subsidizing certification costs and also quality disclosure and here I'm showing you results in, in, in two axes, which is in the x-axis, the change in the number of unbranded generics. So that's like exit trying to capture the market structure part. And then on the y-axis, it's the change in the price of unbranded generics. Okay. And you can see that all these policies lead to exit. So you end up with less products. And all these policies also lead to an increase in prices. Okay. But there's a lot of dispersion. So the one that is the worst in terms of these outcomes is actually the, the quality standard as uh, design. It's actually pretty bad. It increases prices by quite a bit. It induces a lot of exit. Perhaps the best one you could think is this quality disclosure one, which has a, only a minor impact on the number of products and then a somewhat large but still limited impact on prices, okay? But if you wanna think about welfare, actually the one that does be the best is this one, okay? And then, you know, you, then you know what to do is going to depend on the relative weights that the policymaker puts on say spending and these measures of a, of a welfare but the overall message from this um, uh, graph is that actually in a context in which we have some belief right that quality is not great is not perfect right there's you know re, uh, you know you, you can do better or worse but always there is an incentive um, uh, 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 there seem to be a reason to, to, to implement some form of quality regulation because welfare increases in, in all of them, okay? Good, okay, so let me wrap up because we're out of, uh, out of time. So what we do in this uh, paper is to uh, develop an empirical model to, quantifies the, to quantify the mechanisms that play in quality regulation. On the demand side, we think about the asymmetric information and uh, misperceptions. And then on the supply side, we have this certification costs. And we, we, I feel like the results show that it's quite important to model both quality and entry and exit. And that helps quite a bit to interpret the descriptive evidence, okay? So we apply this framework to a setting that we believe is compelling, which is the Chilean market. And we believe has like implications for other uh, developing countries. And we show that, um, that overall quality regulation increased welfare by somewhere between three and 5%. And then we, we offer some lessons for how to design it. We can think of subsidies to certification costs if we care a lot about market structure. We can also think about disclosure if we want to keep kind of like a lot of choice because we think there's a lot of preference heterogeneity among consumers and so forth. And I'm happy to uh, talk more about them if, you know, if, if you guys want to stay. Anyways, thank you very much for, uh, for having me. And um, again, like, uh, please, uh, any, any questions are welcome. So thank you so much, Ignacio. Uh, you know, the floor is open for questions. Uh, feel free to raise your hand and uh, ask, and then, then Maya Maya will uh, unmute you so that you can ask the question directly. But I think Anuj had his hand up for a brief moment. So, Anuj? Yeah, fantastic presentation. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, so here, are we assuming that physicians have no role to play on its, or the incentive structure or the way physicians interact with consumers is going to be completely homogenous. Is that the assumption or uh, the role played by physicians is something that is just not uh, yep. I mean, different enough? No, that's a, that's a really, a really good question that we would like to tackle. So essentially we're being agnostic about what drives demand. So we have a demand model that is, look, you are, so for a given consumer, you know, you're going to choose this, one of these uh, drugs that are in the market, but we don't, we don't essentially pin down why you chose it, right? And it's going to be a combination between physicians and consumers that are going to somehow agree on a prescription and are going to buy a particular drug, right? And that's going to, we would love to, to pin that down. The, the thing is that we don't have prescription data. If we had prescription data and then purchase data, you could say, look, this guy, this consumer got this prescription, but then chose something different. 
then you know we know that consumers and doctors don't always do the same. If we had prescription data and we had we showed that the, we could show that maybe the purchases and prescriptions are like one to one, then that kind of an um, analysis would tell us more about the role of physicians. So here we are not really uh, very well um, equipped to to parse the role of physicians, which is a limitation of the of the data. Got it. Thanks a lot. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good question. I mean, if you wanted to, I mean, yeah, like for some for some questions, that's for sure quite important. Um, I, th I, yeah, yeah, I agree. So I have a question about uh, heterogeneity of consumers. So you know, I'm just trying to think about a world where, say, for example, low income consumers uh, tend to suffer from heart disease more, and high income consumers are less likely to suffer from the disease. Um, the high income consumers care more for quality, the low income consumers care more for price. So, you know, preferences over price versus quality is also correlated with incidence of disease. And so that would distort the welfare analysis, right? Because if you have exits for poor quality but low price drugs, and therefore, you know, this quality regulation is a disproportionate. Uh, sort of, you know, it causes welfare gain, but amongst high income consumers who are anyway less likely to suffer from the disease, you know, then we have to think a little bit about which way the net. So, again, I, 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 right. I also so, like, sorry, I interrupted. No, no, so I'm just saying that this is perhaps, you know, more like future analysis of when you know it can impose that heterogeneity in your consumer. No, okay, so I totally agree. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, in the in the demand model, we really have no heterogeneity. Partly also because of a data limitation, mm -hmm. our our demand data is aggregated; it's not individual, so we can't really build too much heterogeneity there. One thing that we could do is to add some kind of like, sort of like random coefficients to the demand model, and mm -hmm. maybe parameterize that with income and, and try to speak to the role of income. I think that's interesting. Like in your um, like I mean, so, say say we go with your uh, um, prior for what the pattern could be. Like uh, high income care more about quality, less about price, and vice versa for low income. Then I agree with you. Like the, the, there would be a distribution of welfare effects, and the segment of the population that would benefit the most from the policy would be the high income guys. That's yeah. uh, that's true. But yeah. maybe um, like okay, so uh, say that health. So say that say that you really care about the health and quality, the, um, sorry, the, the price and quality part, and we're going to kind of like leave health outcomes apart for a second, right? Then that may be a rationale for doing, say, disclosure instead of regulation. Mm -hmm. Because if you if you if you if there's like a segment of the population that really don't care too much about quality, right, and they care a lot about price. You may want to cater to that segment by leaving the low quality, high price products in the market, but telling people that they are low quality, right? So the so that the price is uh, is uh, adjusts accordingly, and they are not charged high prices for low quality products, right? Yeah. So in the disclosure policy, so I, I okay, so that, that's that's actually a great point. I think this heterogeneity becomes super interesting when thinking about regulation versus disclosure, yeah. and. I think in pharma and in health in particular, we may have strong concerns with leaving the low quality products in the market, but in some other markets where, you know, getting a low quality product is not like lethal in some sense, or it's not like potentially very harmful, this may be a, like a strong rationale for pushing for disclosure as opposed to regulation. That's all. Yeah. Uh, one suggestion is that even if you don't have individual level data, you could perhaps do this at a county level or some sort of geographically disaggregated because then you can type the county by income and incidence of the disease. That's, I agree with that. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, that's a really good point. Yeah. Awesome. I think so. Any other questions? Vishnu has a question. Vishnu, please proceed. Hi, Vishnu. Um, perhaps you can just, yeah. I think we can hear us. We can hear him, yeah. Yeah. 
uh, is there any result on overall consumption before and after treatment? Sorry, can uh, can, can you can you sorry can you repeat, please? Yeah, is there any result on consumption, like overall consumption of drugs before the treatment and after the treatment? Ah, okay. Um, well, we find we find little effects on the on the extensive margin. We have some reshuffling of consumption from um, unbranded generic, so from branded generics to unbranded generics in the descriptive evidence, but it's not super strong uh, from a statistical point of view, right? So the, the result on the extensive margin is perhaps not too surprising since um, uh, there's like some kind of like for the low income people, there's some support and so forth. So you wouldn't expect people to stop consuming drugs uh, at all if they need them for their health. And then the reshuffling part is sort of what the model would predict in some sense. Because the 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 kind of the perceived quality was lowest for the unbranded generics, and then they, so they get the the highest benefit as a segment in terms of increasing their perceived quality, and that leads to substitution towards uh, them. But the, yeah, but the patterns in the descriptive events are are actually fairly weak in that sense. But that's what we find. Okay. Thank you. I don't think we have more questions. Right? All right. So thank you so much, Ignacio, for an awesome talk. Uh, if I can do a, uh, you know, I, I don't have uh, the reactions on my uh, Zoom, but uh, you know, applause, I think, all around <laughs> for a great talk. Uh, so, but, uh, you know, we should have you in person uh, in India sometime. Uh, I would love to go sometime, uh, sometime yeah. for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me and thanks for all the questions and comments. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks Great. a lot. Great. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.